Okay, so we're getting near the end. And I can see it in your eyes that you're all feeling it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we now have Ian here to uh, talk about how uh, you can have a look at uh, your environmental footprint by looking at his environmental footprint. <laughs> Who knows? Thank you. So, hi, I'm Arian. Um, I tend to stuff around with things. Um, I'm not nearly as high tech as some other people who do the most fantastic things around their house. Um, but I have some ideas and sometimes I implement them. Um, luckily, since, I don't know, a year and a half, we've, we've got a house where we can actually do some of that. Um, so very soon after we bought this house, um, we had um, various forms of solar installed, as you can see. So we've got a rather, a rather large surface area there. Um, and you're wondering, okay, why are there only 20 panels? Well, um, putting more on would have got us into trouble with Energex because then you need special permission for, for tying it into the grid. That would have possibly been doable, but um, the main issue is down here, there's trees here, it doesn't work so well. There's trees over there which are quite tall. It would be quite shady. Also, it's not due south, um, north, pardon me, I grew up in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, anyway, it's not due north. Um, the angle is pretty good, but um, yeah, due to all those reasons, sticking more panels on doesn't actually gain us anything, unfortunately. And we had to also work around this little chimney, which is why I have the little gap there and things patched around it. So there are 20 panels, but they're, they're just um, stuffed around a bit. Um, so that's the basis of what we did. Um, and we did it on the basis of um, some calculations. We had a rough idea of what we were paying, of course, in electricity from our previous house. Now, admittedly, the, uh, the houses are different, but you can get some idea in terms of water use, uh, you know, the, the, the hot water that you need, um, all the equipment that you use around the house. You do take that with you, even if, if the light bulbs are different. And um, we worked out from that that sticking this stuff on the roof had a better payback than keeping the money in the bank. So as we did have a little bit of money in the bank, we thought, let's stick this on the roof and we'll feel better for it. So it's a bit of a feel-good factor, but it did make economic sense in terms of a, a modest but, um, but useful invention. Of course, as the electricity price keeps rising, and there's very little chance of it dropping, um, the return on investment goes up vastly. So that's, that's quite nice. Um, so that's the basic idea. Okay, our objectives were to, and still are, to learn about how much energy and, um, you can have the slides, by the way. <laughs> I know, sorry Claire, I thought you were someone else. <laughs> um, so get some insight in, in how much energy and water and, and things we're actually using around the house. And the reason for that is that I learned from, from other sources that when people start monitoring and there's a feedback mechanism that's fairly instantaneous, um, you actually change your behavior because you learn more about the impact of you know, turning things off and on, um, what that actually does to your, to your power bill or your environmental footprint. It's, it, it approximately amounts to the same thing, of course. If you use, use less electricity and less hot water, um, inevitably your, your bills are going to be lower, which, which is nice for the planet as well as for your, for your, um, for your bank account. So the easiest things for us to have a look at, um, basically hack into those systems, were the hot water system and the electricity system because those bits were newly installed. As I mentioned, we, we got those installed. And so I made sure that when we got those installed, actually some extra things were put into place for us. With the hot water system, um, we decided on the rooftop system, as you can see here, there, um, which I'll get back to later. Um, a rooftop system doesn't have um, any particular controls. It runs on gravity. The idea is that this, it used to be about one meter higher than that, but this, this works as well. The point is that the, um, the gravity makes sure the water drops down into the collector on, on one of those, uh, on that pipe. And then because the water heats up, it, um, it actually likes going back 
up there. Um, so it uses simple, simple scientific trickery to not require a pump. That's rather nice. Um, and this, this tank is fairly heavily insulated and, and therefore having it on the roof is not, not a particularly big problem. The booster in there, which is just the, the heating element with a, um, with a temperature sensor, is very, very stupid. Um, you'd have a switch downstairs in the house, in our case, in the garage, and when it's on, it would essentially be on all the time. The only thing that would make it not boost is if the temperature in the vat is actually warmer than that the temperature that it, that it triggers on. It's very, very stupid. So most people actually keep the booster off all the time. Only when you really, really need that hot water and you don't have enough sun would you click it on. But it's a manual process. You kind of need to look outside, turn on the hot tap, figure out that you don't have enough hot water and turn it on and, and half an hour, an hour later, you've got a bit more, more hot water. Um, I didn't think that was a particularly shiny, shiny way of handling things. I thought we can do better than that. So I did have them put in that switch because that's the way they work, but um, I had them do some extra stuff. The tank, as well as the collectors, so I'll call this the tank or the vat, and I call these collectors because they're not panels. Those are panels, those are collectors. Um, they are the same whether you use this integrated rooftop system or a split system that does have control mechanisms. And what you can get is a little, um, a, like these, these control, um, no, not control, but the, the pipes that are used to connect the, the external pipes can get extra trickery put into them, like an internal little tube, and then you can slide in a sensor into that tube, and it is really close to the hot water at that point, and you can actually take decent temperature measurements. So what I got the people who installed this to do is essentially kit it out with the hardware in terms of pipes that would be used on a split system, and then I gave them two digital temperature sensors that I um, got from uh, Little Bird Electronics to, to shove in there and um, had them put it through the roof and I just had the, the digital signal then to, to deal with. So I have measurements from the collector and I've got measurements from the vat. Um, the mechanism that they themselves would use are analog sensors, uh, PT-1000 sensors. Um, they are annoying. PT-1000 sensors are entirely usable. They've been around for many decades. They are analog, so they just provide a, provide a, a differing um, resistance depending on, uh, depending on the temperature, and the curve is fairly, fairly well known. They need an op-amp um, before you stuff it into an Arduino analog port, so it requires extra hardware to make it work. If you use a digital sensor, however, you can just talk with it. It's a tiny little processor, essentially. Um, it's much easier to use. So replacing one with the other is just actually saving money and hassle, okay? So, um, yeah, so that's how we started that. Um, we wanted to have it cheap and fairly non-intrusive into our lives. Um, and for that, we also decided to do it, have the control done locally and not a central control mechanism. So we don't have a computer in the house that controls stuff. Um, I know how that can be really, really interesting, um, but I think it's also really, really problematic because let's say that computer crashes and we've been away for a couple of days and we come home, we'd really like hot water. It becomes a problem. Um, so by simplifying things and not having a central really, really smart thing, that means that central thing can't crash, means we don't have the problem. Um, sometimes the monitoring system um, stuffs up, it runs on a Raspberry Pi, I'll, you'll see it later, um, doesn't do anything problematic to the hot water system because it's independent, it just talks to the logging system. Okay, um, and th this applies in particular to the, to the hot water, of course. You really, really want the hot water, to have hot water when you open the tap. There's just no, no real choice there. The electricity system will work anyway. We, we don't intercept it anyway. We just monitor it at the moment. Um, so I hope you can actually read this now. Is it readable from back there? That's a bummer. Um, Claire, do you have your, your phone that you can look this up live and then just send it around the room? <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. 
I'll, I'll give you the rough overview and Claire will send it around so you can actually see it live. Um, and if you want, really want to jot down the URL, it's unprotected at the moment, you can just look to it, it is public. Um, so there's a logging time, just gives the current time. It basically tells me whether the logging system has crashed or not. Um, <laughs> then there's the solar H2O, I needed to make sure, that, so that's the solar hot water system. It gives me the roof temperature, in this case it's 37.43 Celsius, it was a colder day, and the VAT temperature, which is 43.51. So in this case the VAT is already warmer than the roof, um, than the roof uh, collector, which means that there wasn't any water flowing, it wasn't actually warming anything up. Um, hot water use, off. So no one had the hot water tap on anywhere in the house. Um, off, yeah, as simple as that. Then this is the solar um, electricity, so PV, photovoltaic. Um, the first number is how many kilowatts we are um, producing from the roof. Um, so point, uh, point 0.71 means 710 um, watt, watt hours if it were to actually do something useful. So 710 uh, 10 watts. Um, what voltage it is um, feeding into the, what voltage is going around in our system, which is actually a direct reflection of what happens in the grid. The grid's voltage is not a constant. It can be anywhere between 230-ish to 250-ish. It is wildly variable. Um, so if you think, oh, I have 240 volts, no you don't. Um, normally you really, really wouldn't care, but in this case we do care because otherwise you can't actually calculate uh, various things and in particular what goes into the grid and what comes out of the grid, it becomes a very dodgy calculation because you have more than one variable to, um, to work out. And those, um, yeah, it just is impossible. So I'll, I'll tell you how I got to that number because that's, that's quite a nifty trick um, that I didn't invent but I'm happily using it. Okay, so then um, the information here is already slightly processed. This is what we're either feeding into the grid or getting out. In this case, we're feeding it in because it's in green. If we were getting it out of the grid, I would print it in red. And the same happens here. If we're using hot water, I put it in red because any consumption, I want to know and actually be aware that we're actually not making a profit at that point in time. So anytime we use hot water, we lose a bit of, of energy there. Anytime we get energy from the grid, we're actually paying for it and that's not a nice thing. So I'd like to be aware and actually see it in red. Um, so at the moment, we're actually making a profit. That makes sense. Um, we're, we're producing 0 .7, uh, 0 0.71 kilowatts. We're feeding 0.15 in the grid, admittedly not much. So we're actually making one cent um, an hour. I admit it's not much, but it's something. We're at least not, uh, not paying more. Um, we're actually saving much more than that by having solar power. This is the actual real amount of money we're, we're making because we get 10 cents per kilowatt hour. It's not any fancy deal, we're just, um, we're not getting anything, uh, this is in Queensland, we're not getting anything from the state, we're just signed up with Click Energy and they gave us 10 cents um, for any, any kilowatt hour that we feed into the grid. Um, if we didn't have solar at all, um, then we would be chewing 557 watts at that particular time of day, so half a kilowatt hour. Kilowatt hour in Queensland costs 28.4 cents, so we would be paying about 15 cents an hour to run this. So our actual savings are larger, but this is the actual real money that we're making in real time, aside from investments and, and other trickery. Um, so yeah, the calculation is here, this is how much we're using. Now, I'll explain in a little while when I get to the solar uh, power system, how we actually get to those numbers, because not all of them are numbers that we really measure, some of them are calculated. So this thing, um, what you see there, and hopefully, uh, are you sending it around, Claire? Yep, everybody's having a look, excellent. Um, thank you. Um, so this is a little Android, it's an old Android phone, fairly large, and um, I just balanced it inside the um, cabinet that we have at home, and I know that's a really terrible photo, there was a flash, and I didn't realize, there's the phone. So, um, and this is the door to the laundry. So it's, it's in the living room essentially, high up on the ceiling, uh, high up on the, on the wall, uh, above a door. And 
it's got a, a power over Ethernet switch, it's got a patch panel, um, so it's got that thing. So anyone who walks past can actually see that, that number, but anybody on their phone or whatever can, can also see it. I just haven't bothered putting a big screen somewhere. You know, again, it's intrusive into the household and it's not really necessary. Uh, both Claire and I walk past this regularly and are just interested in what's going on and that actually does, does already have that feedback um, effect. Um, so when we got the house, I needed to, to have my office downstairs. I needed to shuffle around the, the phone line because my router couldn't be where the phone line came in. So that's how we ended up there. And I took the opportunity to get some, um, some Cat5 shuffled around the house. So at various places around the house, we now have gigabit ethernet and power over ethernet and that kind of stuff. Why power over ethernet? Because it's really cheap these days. It used to be horrendously expensive, isn't anymore. And it's a nice way to actually get power to various locations without having to use additional power blocks. Um, so I think it's actually quite cost efficient and, and energy efficient. Um, so I'll get back to that as well. So now continuing with the hot water system. This is what things look like in our garage. Um, I don't think I took a photo before I took the switch out. Um, so underneath there used to be that switch. So just an on-off switch, do I want the booster to be on or not? What it has now is a little, you know, circuit breaker board, um, all, neatly, all neatly standard and official, um, but it works a bit more nifty compared to what it used to do. So there's a digital kilowatt hour meter here, which I can actually tap um, pulses from. I'm not doing that at the moment. I haven't put the code in the Arduino, which is hiding in there. I'll show that in a moment. Um, but it at least tracks how much our um, hot water system is chewing in terms of power purely for that system, rather than more generically, how much power am I using in the house? So it gives me a bit of extra information. They're about 20, 20, 25 dollars to get one of those. Um, they are standard DIN rail things. So if you've got enough space in your in your switchboard, you can actually add a whole lot of them on different circuits, and you would actually gain quite a lot of information. So that's a quite a nice thing. Um, the next one is a switch, which is normally off, and that essentially takes the place of the old switch that it used to have. So if you flick that one, it's forced on and no longer effectively, it, it bypasses the control of the Arduino. Okay, so it just gives the booster power and should the temperature be lower than the, um, than the thermostatic setting, it'll, um, it'll go up. By the way, the thermostatic setting of the booster cannot be changed by um, mere mortals who don't want to climb on the roof. You actually need to climb on the roof, find the right location and then tweak with a screwdriver and apparently it's a very, very, um, I don't know, not quite dodgy mechanism, but it's not particularly precise. Um, we've had a look on the roof and we actually can't find the right spot to, to muck around yet. So it's, it's, that's a work in progress. I'd like it a bit higher, but again, I'll, I might get back to that. This is a, oh, I forget what they're called. Um, there's a fancy term for them. Essentially, it's a relay, but it, 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 um, it controls 240 volts rather than, rather than a low, lower voltage. And again, it's a DIN rail standard block. So I can use an Arduino with a relay driver to control that. Um, so that makes it neat. That's the high voltage bit. That's the little control bit, and they don't interfere with each other, which makes it all kind of safe and, safe and standard. The cabling you see, um, this will be the Ethernet cable going out. It goes up there. I'll show you that in a moment. That cable is the end of the cabling, maybe the other way around. Um, that cable is the end of the cabling that goes up to the roof. So I'm just using a Cat5 cable with a couple of wires that connect to the, the two temperature sensors. Okay? Um, that's the control cable to, um, from the Arduino to the relay there. And it also that is already connected, it also contains the, the pulse um, connector from the, um, from the kilowatt hour meter. Then this wire goes all the way over here. This is a hot wa or a water flow meter. So when we had the hot water system put in, I essentially had to just ask them to, to add that meter. That's a plastic one. I'm not particularly pleased with it. Um, it was leaking a bit. We've actually replaced it. 
It's now not leaking. I think there's now a leak somewhere around there. I need to unclip these cable ties and, and see what's going on in there. I think one of those joints is leaking. So it might not have anything to do with our system. What I, rec what I would recommend if you want to do something like this, get a metal one, which are vastly more expensive. That, that's about $20. Um, but you really don't want to have the risk of um, getting leaks in your hot water system. If, um, you know, this is the cold water pipe. This is the hot water pipe out. This is also cold water and this is a mixer. Um, so that means that the house never gets more than 50 degrees out of the tap. That's the way that works. Now, if you turn the cold water off, it essentially creates a vacuum up on the roof. So then if I take this one out, if I unscrew that, nothing will actually happen. It'll, 320 liters will just dangle above your head. That's perfectly fine. Okay, now if you turn the water mains back on, you will get 320 meters coming down really, really quickly. So if this thing ever breaks, we've got a major flood on our hands and we won't actually notice that quickly um, because it's in the garage, you don't notice. And of course the flow meter will be broken so I won't, won't actually see it. So it'll be a wet nightmare. Um, so as I mentioned, it's probably okay now, um, the way it's done, it has some hemp um, coating around the edges and hemp um, fiber has the um, it's a standard trick that, that smart um, plumbers use, and a smart plumber did that one. Um, hemp expands when it's, when it's wet, so it actually is good at, good at sealing those joints. But yeah, anyway, get a more expensive metal one that has a good, um, you know, a good switch then for, for sensing the flow. Um, so essentially it has a little, um, um, you know, rotating fan in the water which just runs free um, and there's a metal bit on that and then there's a hall effect sensor in the dry part that detects the metal bit buzzing around. It is that simple. Okay, that is just gratuitous fun. Um, that's part of the gig ethernet network. That is a corner of the garage. So our garage has gig ethernet just because. Um, that is where we get our power for the Arduino, which saves me the hassle of having an extra adapter and finding a plug somewhere and that kind of stuff. I had a plug before, and after that I just got a power over Ethernet um, um, board from, uh, from John Oxer's Freetronics, and, and now it's, it's feeding off there, which is actually much easier. So this is the Arduino in the box. Um, the reason you can't see everything properly is because there's little little labels tagging everything. So it, it assists me finding which wire is where. It doesn't assist you in actually seeing what's going on, unfortunately. Um, so roughly there's an, ether, um, there's an ether 10 there. There's the power of ethernet board sitting there on top of it. They, they fit onto each other. Um, there's the relay drivers there and there's a real time clock over there. Um, maybe we don't need the real time clock because it's network connected anyway. It could do some NTP magic and get the time from the network. Blah. Um, you know, those things, I don't know, five or ten dollars depending on where you get them. It's not really worthwhile fussing about. They tend to work really, really well once they get going and they last for many, many years. Um, so we just have our own local time source. Um, I don't even care if that time source is out by a couple of seconds as long as it's not out by, by hours or days, if that makes sense, because otherwise my graphs go, go wonky. Um, so this system monitors, and um, it monitors the hot water system. It catches how much water we're using as well, and the hot water system then is also controlled by that system. So yes, it feeds data into the network that we can log, but it's independent in that it doesn't need to ask anyone for instructions on what to do next. It has its own logic and that is kind of what, what I'd like it to do. That's the rule set um, that's built into the Arduino code. So H stands for hours. Um, this is just pseudo code. Um, H stands for hours, Temp is for temperature in degrees. Um, it gets it much more precise than that. It gets it to the hundreds of degrees, but you know, not bothering with that for this. Um, and that's, that's the logic. So if it's after 2 p.m. before 8 p.m., and the temperature is less than 42 degrees, or between um, 4 uh, a.m. and 7 a.m., and the temperature is lower than 40 degrees, then we want the booster to run, okay? Um, if it's outside those times, we do not want the booster to run. 
Why not? Because we're not going to be using a lot of hot water. There will still be hot water in the vat anyway, but no one's having showers. Um, this is usually Claire and I having showers, and this is the kids having, having showers in the evening. That works out nicely. So this is our home rule set. For you, it would be different, obviously, but that's, you know, you grab the code and you change it a bit. We could make it programmable in the e in the EEPROM of the of the Arduino rather than rather than just stick it in any code, but you know, this is local code, I don't care. Yes. Um, then regardless of this rule, if the um, you know this this turns it on essentially and this rule turn it turns it off. Um, this turns it off slightly before the um, the thermostat in the booster turns it off. That the booster gets to about 47, that's just where they've put it. I'd like them to put it higher, um, at 50 something maybe, because then we have the choice of actually having more hot water in the vat. Because you mix the hot water when you get it out of the tap anyway, like for your shower, even if the hot water is 50 or 60 degrees, you would still get no more than 50 out anyway, and then you mix it down with cold to get it to about 38 degrees, which is what the shower is. If you had a thermostatic tap, there would be click at 38, and then you can pass it through, and some people like thir 39 or 40 degrees, but beyond that, it starts to get really scalding hot. So your normal water is about 38 to 40 degrees. Um, so having, you could have a higher capacity hot water tank, even without adding more hot water, by just having it hotter. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. Um, so yeah, we'd like it potentially a little bit hotter, but you know, this is the basic thing. On a really sunny day, the tank gets to 70, 70 or more degrees anyway. Uh, how far have we got it? 80 degrees? Yeah. Hmm? I think we hit 80. Yeah, I think we did hit 80, so that, that's, that's all quite fine. Um, but anyway, this is what it does now, and this logic seems to work fairly well. So what actually comes out? So this, this rule set keeps our house in hot water, and I don't have to flick the booster switch ever again. Um, there's a logic fault in the actual code. So this logic is good, but it's pseudo code. The actual code is buggy. Um, <laughs> I need to figure out what it is and, and fix it because sometime, was it a number of weeks ago? Oh, somewhere in the last month, we really needed to flick the switch because something had gone completely wonky and we didn't have hot water where we needed it to. So, bugs happen. Um, but it's really very rare. We hadn't touched it for over half a year before that. So that was pretty good. So this is the stuff that comes out. So how am I communicating with the, com the monitoring, uh, the, the logging system? Well, an Ether 10 Arduino is a standard Arduino. It's like an Arduino Uno with an Ethernet, um, um, what you call it, uh, breakout on top of it, but it's integrated in a single circuit board. That's wonderful, but a standard Arduino and Arduino Uno doesn't have an awful lot of memory of any kind. It doesn't have much ROM and it doesn't have much RAM. So running even a little bit of TCP IP on it is painful. You can do it, but after that you can't do anything with it because you don't have the capacity. So either you would use two Arduinos, and they're cheap as, so you know you could do that, or you need to reduce your needs a little bit. Um, so instead of doing TCP magic, I started doing UDP magic and ripping out some of the, some of the includes to get rid of the TCP stuff. So that just, it mainly actually reduces the, t the memory consumption when it's running rather than the storage of the program. Um, I still have a fair, essentially shortage of that, but it, the controller doesn't need to do very much, so it works. So essentially we're sending lines out through UDP which get picked up elsewhere, okay? Um, and it's sending it out in in little CSV lines, it's simple to create. Um, maybe I shouldn't even bother with that because again, in Arduino, it's simple to create, but it does cost a little bit of code. I could send it out in more binary form and pick it apart on another end, but it seemed like a simple, simple thing to do. And listening to a UDP stream actually is really, really easy to do. Um, you can just use netcat and pipe it into a file. That's the dumb way of doing it. So, you know, that, that works nicely. So what we have here is just a tiny little snippet from well, early last year, um, 2014, uh, that's March. Um, so SHW flow, which means the solar hot water system, the flow rate. So that's the, the, um, the, the sensor in the pipe. Um, at that time, it got, since the previous second, it got 105 clicks of that sensor. And then you can calculate how much flow that actually creates. 
if that were to go on for an entire minute, we would be using 6.32 liters a minute. So that's the calculation the system does for us. It is actually quite hard to figure out from this how much water we're actually using. So we don't actually have a, a very good measure of um, how much water have we used this day. You can work it out, but it becomes a bit painful, yeah, because it fluctuates, as you can tell, okay? Um, so if you had a, a decent water meter, just like a kilowatt hour meter, you could actually tell it to count volume rather than flow, and it works out nicely. You could actually know exactly how much you're using. I think that would be much preferred. Um, so that's one half of it. This is the other half. Um, so it's a different tag, SHRW temp. Those are the two temperature sensors, and they also report no more than once a second, same as the other one, and this is the temperature on the roof, and this is the temperature in the vat. And you see it's fairly precise, and that allows us, what is that, 10? Hmm? 10, okay, thank you. Um, it allows us just to, to get a good idea of how fast uh, temperature is going up or down or, or anything like that. So that's quite, um, quite useful. Then, um, this is the, the little mess, and I, I freely admit it's a bit of a mess. Um, in, the, um, in the rack, at the bottom of the rack, we have a Raspberry Pi. It's got a hard disk, a spinning hard disk below it. If you were to store this on the SD card, you're burning out your SD card. The number of writes is such that that really, really doesn't work. So get a, get a little, little hard disk and plug it in. So we're using a hub um, to, to power the uh, USB, uh, USB based uh, drive and then power that through to the, um, to the Raspberry in here, it's tied into the network, into the switch. Um, this here is a little Arduino. Um, that's a um, um, Pro Mini. And where is it hiding? There. There's a tiny little RFM12B receiver. It's running at 912, 915 megahertz. That's the receiver that we use to pick up from the electricity system, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, so anyway, the Arduino, pi uh, the Raspberry picks up that, um, that stream and sticks it in a log, and that's pretty much the end of it right now. I can, I can plot that um, graphically, and I'm, I haven't even done that properly, but I've got a long list of data, obviously. Um, so that's how that works. I'm not actually particularly pleased with these Raspberry Pis. Um, these are the first models and they had pretty dodgy ethernet. It resets frequently because it's on the USB bus, and the USB bus itself actually resets quite frequently. I, I understand that the new model um, uh, Raspberry actually does much better on that, um, but yeah, that one is actually causing grief quite frequently. So now overview of the electricity system. Um, on the left you see a broader overview of the corner of the house. That's the inverter, that's the the stuff that comes from the house, uh, from the rooftop, it's in two arrays, the top one and the bottom one. Bottom one is number one, top one is number two. We can monitor that on there. Um, there is actually an RS-485 interface on there, which I will tap into. Um, I just haven't bothered yet. I've got the hardware, um, and there's an Arduino there, so we can actually get it in, but I haven't actually bothered with that yet. Here's the normal switchboard. This is the replacement um, energy meter that we got from Energex. That's for night tariff, um, you know, uh, what is it, off-peak, that we're not actually using anymore. Um, down there is the little trickery. Oh, and here, yeah, here you see two wires. Those wires, one is, um, they're essentially just those, um, those induction clips onto, um, onto any, any one of the wires, and they, they measure how much flow of current there is. One is attached to the grid, the grid end of essentially what, what goes in this meter. Um, and the other one is clamped to the wire that comes in from the, um, from the solar um, on the roof. And if I can also work out whether I'm taking power off the grid or putting power in the grid, and I'll tell you in a moment how I do that, I can actually work out by differentiating those two, subtracting one from the other, I can actually work out how much we're using inside the house. It's an indirect measurement, okay, calculation. Here I'm using something, it's an Arduino-based system called Open Energy Monitor. I know there's also other mechanisms and they're perfectly cool too. 
Um, this was just the one I discovered at the time. Um, so it's a board that's particularly specifically built to be electricity safe, but there's no high voltage in there. Um, it picks up everything. There's a tiny little Arduino there um, with a one of those RFM 12B um, transceivers again. And that is an AC-AC power adapter. It gives me a, const uh, a voltage that I feed into there, and it allows the um, Arduino controller there to figure out what the actual voltage is on the grid, because it's relative, the voltage that comes out of there is relative to the voltage on the grid, yeah? Because it's a regular transformer, AC-AC. It also measures the phase of that, um, of that current. And they've worked out that the phase is different when we're feeding um, power into the grid compared to getting power out of the grid. So by comparing that, it actually lets me know whether I'm, whether I'm consuming or feeding. So that's actually very nifty. So it just uses an electronic trick. Uh, Sparkies actually don't believe in this. They think you can't measure it. They're wrong. Because <laughs> we are. <laughs> it's that simple. There's documentation on that. So what are we seeing um, on the meter? The rough thing we try to do in the house is we'd like that number to be higher than that number. Because that's the consumption number. How much did we get out? This is how much did we stuff in. It's spring. Um, we're actually 400 kilowatts behind. But we can, we can win more than, than 10 kilowatts a day. So, you know, in a couple of months, we'll actually be ahead again. That's the idea. So in the winter, we lose some. In the summer, we win some. And overall, over a whole year, we actually run a surplus, which is good. Um, but yeah, on an individual basis, day to day, we may not run a surplus, and that's just the way it is right now. Um, OK, the electricity data via the Raspberry Pi and the transmission receiving system, um, we send to pvoutput.org, and um, then you get this kind of data. Um, so we know from that um, how much we generate in a day, um, how much we export, how much we import, um, and then the efficiency is derived from that. The dollar amounts are complete crap because I haven't been able to put in a dollar amount of what my electricity costs and what I feed in. It also assumes that you pay the same amount compared to what you get back, which is inevitably not true. Um, some people on fantastic deals get back more than they pay, or in any case, it's never equal, okay? And here's where we're in the plus or minus during a single day. So red is, is minus and plus, you know, green is, green is plus. Makes pretty graphs, and they're really, really very nice. They're, they're interactive JavaScripted and so on. Um, the, the green stuff is generation, the yellow stuff is export, red is consumption, blue is how much we have saved, and um, this curve is our efficiency. Um, so rainy days, that's all there's to it, and then at some point it actually dips there, so we've actually used more than we've um, produced on that particular day. So that's quite, quite instructive. Um, so what have we learned from all this? <coughs> Sorry. Um, our behavior's definitely been influenced a little bit. We take more care about what we turn on and what we leave on and, and that kind of stuff, because we prefer to not see that red at the bottom where we're no longer making money off the grid. Um, sometimes we're still a bit sloppy with leaving things on standby, um, but we actually found that leaving things on standby doesn't use as much as it used to. It actually has very little effect, and even having a couple of servers running around the house, sometimes at night it, the whole house uses that than two, less than 200 watts, and that's actually quite nice. Um, so it could use even less, but there's always little bits buzzing around. You know, fridges tend to be on and, and, and other things. Um, I reckon on consideration that a split hot water system would have been better. Um, we think, even though it's insulated, we're losing about a degree per hour in midwinter. Um, and that might be because it's on the roof rather than next to or in the garage. I think it would do better in the garage, if that makes sense. So, you know, it's less exposed to wind and whatever, and, and I think it would have a better effect. And the actual cost. It was pretty much a moot point. I could have chosen it the other way. I just thought, yeah, on the roof is probably okay. Mistake. Um, better yet, and this comes from Richard Keats, who did a keynote on this last year. He told me just flat out, and he wrote the book, a book on it, literally, um, from Beyond Zero Emissions, um, that a heat pump is probably a better idea than a hot water system. 
um, because the heat pump can run during the day on your um, on the solar. And then at night, it doesn't matter whether I use the booster from the grid um, and use some nighttime power or whether the heat pump uses some nighttime power. That would be the same thing anyway. Um, and heat pumps are pretty efficient. So using a heat pump instead would possibly be the better way. And then his argument is, well, if you want to plaster your entire roof in solar panels anyway, you would have more space for them. I think that's a fair call. Um, we're not quite ready to go off grid because even though we run a surplus over the year, we can run a serious deficit over the winter. We would not have sufficient um, power generation, just in terms of power um, or hot water, because we need to use power for that as well, to you know, store enough to be able to use it overnight and, um, and be completely clear of the grid. So we're not yet off-grid capable. I think what we did is the only way to actually figure that out because otherwise we wouldn't have had the numbers to actually tell that in a sensible way. All righty, questions? Yo, Pete. Um, what's that, sorry? Um, I don't know, I could put the switch back. Um, I could give the house buyer the choice. I'd probably take, it's not really worthwhile getting that rack off the wall, just leave some giant holes. I wouldn't mind taking my switch with me and the other gear in there, but yeah, the Arduino in the garage runs independently and it just keeps running, it's, it's absolutely harmless. The settings might need to change. You know, for user, user friendliness, it's not. At the moment, uh, we'd have to change the Arduino code to actually update the, the hours if, if someone wants to change the logic. So that's just the thing. I might replace it back with the switch. I mean, we still have the switch, just a matter of taking the stuff off the wall, putting that back. Um, the water meter is harmless. Um, yeah, sadly, these things are not really standardized. The, the commercial stuff that is out there, I find limiting. I don't want to measure my electricity production by logging into the vendor's website with the ability to download it. Somehow that grates on me. I don't care for it, sorry. And many of the things run on Arduino and, and, and raspberries anyway. You know, why do they insist that I go to their site? I want it here, but then, you know, if I buy their stuff, I, I'm stuck with that kind of environment. So. Um, Yes, I can't quite standardize it to that point that it becomes user-friendly. I could build a bit more user-friendliness into that box in the garage, obviously. A little OCD displays, a couple of buttons. It can probably work there. And that, that, would, uh, that would just make it a smart thermostat, essentially. Because that's what we created, you know? There's, there's nothing special around it. It's just a choice. Okay. Does that answer your question, by the way? Yep. Just, just a comment, because I, yep. I, uh, there'll be a bit of home into automation integration myself. Yep. Yeah. Is that you leave behind enough documentation um, or hmm. plan to support it yourself? Because otherwise, what's going to happen is that it will break after a while and they're going to have to rip it out and place it with something else anyway. Yeah. I did, I did some analog home automation years ago, a control system for my brother's house in the Netherlands, and that was in the early 90s or something, and it still runs to today, and it still runs the hot water system there, and it just works. Yeah, when something breaks, there's a little bit of doodahs, but the schematics are there, so, you know, an, an electrotechnical engineer will have to muck around with it. Yep. Okay, um, out of time almost. Last questions then? Anyone, anyone? Yo. Um, what you saw there is not a smart meter. Okay, yeah. uh, Queensland doesn't do smart meters. Right. Um, Smart meters, some are not necessarily locked. Well, they might be locked down, but you can get data out of them. Um, but it might not actually be the data you want. The question is, what data do you really want, and do you really need to tap into it um, through that mechanism? The, the meter doesn't know an awful lot. It knows what you put in and what you took out, and maybe when. But if you're sitting there all the time anyway, you know the when. So if you keep an eye on what goes in and what goes out, You've got all the data you need, and the smart meter is not going to add to it. Does that make sense? So, yeah, you could tap into it, but it doesn't actually benefit you, so why bother? That would be my approach. Um, I would like to get a bit more data out of the inverter, because the inverter knows which array gets more
power and how they're behaving. It has to do with shade and sunshine and, and all that. That might actually be quite useful. Um, and it has some extra, it has some extra information about the efficiency and, and the behavior with the grid. It knows when the grid drops away. So what these inverters do is they need to synchronize their voltage with the grid. The downside is that when the grid drops away, as in there's a power cut in the street, I don't have any solar power either. This is a real suck. Um, there are power routers that work around that by kind of providing you with a separate plug that can kind of feed off the inverter off the roof, but it only turns on when the grid is off and then you have power there, but it's completely separate from your house stuff. So this all sucks. This is really not a very good system in a way. I want that thing to have a kind of a stable power and feed it into my house when it's not on the grid because when the grid goes away for half an hour, I've got this whole solar array doing nothing. It's not making money and everything in the house is suddenly bleep bleeping because there's a couple of UPSs buzzing. You know, in my office I have a UPS and in that box I've got a UPS. Um, you know, just to keep the baseline <laughs> in the house running. That's the, by far the cheapest way of making your power reliable, a couple of UPSs. But nevertheless, I think those inverters have a lot to answer for. I think we can do better. I understand why they need to synchronize with the grid, but I think the mechanism by which it does that could be much better. And then when you have things like batteries in between and so on, you know, the, the whole setup could be much, much easier to manage. So adding batteries to this is not entirely straightforward. And then allowing us to be partially off grid is again a pain. We'd need completely different setup again. So, yeah, but the hardware does exist. It just costs us again. Okay. Tesla What's that? Tesla power. Grid. Tesla power. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, power wall. Yeah. Um, definitely a good idea. A bit costly at the moment. And again, as I mentioned, it wouldn't actually help us at the moment. It would actually work on the grid. It, yeah, the point is we're not actually producing enough in winter to keep us off grid for a length of time. Yes, it, it, would keep us, um, it would keep us alive for a while, but the thing is it still wouldn't keep our solar panels working when the grid is, uh, has gone away. So it would deal with the power outage. Now. It's uh, like a giant UPS essentially, but, but still it, it's, because it's fairly costly right now and doesn't actually enable us to um, you know, survive a number of, of um, of uh, cloudy days, it's, it's still a problem, but we're thinking about it. Yep. Thank you. <laughs>